I would like to tell you in 18 minutes an unbearably light story about the medium of light. And uh, I would like to start with the beginning, and I brought some goods with me, and uh, the first thing I would like to show you is this. This is a lamp, and it's almost 100 years old. This is one of the first lamps produced by Philips to shed light on this world. And uh, that sets a little bit the scene of uh, this talk. And uh, this, this intrigues me. It has intrigued me always. Uh, and, and I think it, it is amazing to see that an object like this has survived for more than 100 years. And uh, let, let me show you what, uh, what the reason is a little bit behind this. Here you see the inventor, at least the person. It's Thomas Alva Edison. He is known as the, uh, the guy who invented the incandescent lamp. And if you look into history, that statement basically is totally wrong. Friedel and Israel, two historians, have already revealed a long time ago that at least 22 other persons in the world um, submitted patents on the incandescent lamp prior to this guy. But what did he do right, you may ask then? Well, he brought the invention to you, so to mankind. And he did that by three different types of elements. The first element was that his vacuum was superior. The second element is that his filament was superior. And the resistance was superior. And as a result of that, this guy could connect the entire thing to the grid. And that was important. But the interesting thing at that point in time was that there was no grid. So what this is guy, and by the way, he did a lot of other inventions, and if you go into his record, you can see that he at least has some thousand, thousand patents in his name. This guy was a living invention machine. But back to the story. So what he did is he invented the incandescent lamp for the simple reason that he was annoyed with the fact that the people in his factory didn't work at night. <laughs> so what he said was, let there be light. And also, that was not new. There was another guy who said that before. But he didn't give a damn. <laughs> so what did he do? He invented the incandescent lamp, and he built a factory that we know as GE, and that was the first factory to deliver power to people, power in terms of electricity. And the left slide shows you that it takes a long time to really um, get a lot of access points at least in that point in, uh, at that point in time. So 30 years it took to get some 3 million access points. But the other thing that is important is that, so this guy was shaping his own world. That's what I'm trying to say as a message to you. But at the other point, also the way the interaction was done with the light was different because at that point in time, people lit their candles with a match. And in every room where there was an incandescent lamp invented by Edison, there was this small sign close to the door, notifying persons not to lit the lamp with a match. <laughs> well, you laugh about it, ladies and gentlemen, but it is a change in paradigm of interaction. And much of my story is a call for a change of paradigm in the way we work with light. So let's move on. I've shown you this lamp in the box, almost 100 years old. You see some samples over here. But if you look at the lamps that you apply at your homes, they are still the same. So what the hell happened in the 120 years in between? Well, people made a lot of inventions. And here you see all kinds of graphs that are simply aimed at creeping up higher. And higher means that more light comes out of a lamp as one unit of power, which we call watt. And you see that over the years, a tremendous improvement has been made. So that's what these guys have been doing for 120 years, until there was a disruption, a new development. And that is what we call LED. So light emitted from silicon devices. The idea was not so new. It dates back to 62 of the past century. And Holoniak was the inventor. But the interesting thing is that it is truly disruptive in the sense that this rat race for emitting sufficient light as a unit, of per each unit of watts of power, that is truly ramping up 
very rapidly. So what is the message? The message is simple. The message is that the lighting or the lamps industry is making a change. So what they have to do is in 12 years, they will replace 80 <coughs> billion of turnover from incandescent or gas discharge lamps to lamps or light that is emitted by solid state lighting. And that is interesting. So the first thing that you do is then you use the retrofit. So you take the old form factor and put an LED in it. But that you could compare with this advantage. <laughs> so what you see here is the first automobile of the world. At that point in time, people had carriages and they were pulled by horses. So what they simply did, they killed the horses and put the motor inside <laughs> and called that a car. Well, everyone who looks outside and drives a car nowadays knows that there is some development over here. And that's exactly what is going to happen with light as well. We speak about the liberation of light. So after 120 years of light being captured in a bulb, it's set free. And the interesting new features are low power, long lifetime, high color flexibility, low temperature, miniaturization, embedding, advanced control, blah, blah, blah. But you will be asking yourself, what the heck are we going to do with this? And I try to shed some light on that. The basic statement is, lighting goes digital. Every lamp of the future will be a small computer emitting light. So that means that you can do with a lamp whatever you are used to do with a computer. And that's an interesting statement. So what does that mean? That means that all the goodies that we know from computing science are also going to enter the domain of light. So light will become a new medium. Basically what will happen to the lighting industry is this, what has happened to the media industry 30 years ago. The interesting point is that the lighting industry has only 10 years to achieve this which is interesting. So all these notions that you can read here, so distributed systems control, media processing, end user programming, computational intelligence, interaction design, experience prototype, human factors, all that blah blah has to be turned into something meaningful. And what can it be? Let me start with the fact that there is more to it than just the development in electronics. What you see here is that we have a new photoreceptor. It has been discovered some eight years ago. So inside your eye, there were these two already known for a long time photoreceptors, the rods and the cones, that can help you to see color and to see sharp. But there is a third photoreceptor, and it couples directly into your hormonal system. So the, it steers the production of melatonin. It, couples to the blue light in the morning and to the red light in the evening. And it makes you productive in the morning, at least that was the intention, and it makes you go to sleep in the evening. And also, looking at what happens today, that is an intention, because most of us will get no sleep before three o'clock. So, what can we do with this? Here you see an example. This is an artificial window. It's an armature. It's a lamp. So the sunlight is simulated. It shines in, and you get the feeling in the morning that it is morning, and you get the feeling in the evening that it is evening by the way the lamp changes the color temperature and the intensity. That can be used in all kinds of settings, like natural office settings, and it is already known that productivity can be increased substantially by choosing the right wavelength and delivering it to people in the right pulsation. This is another example. Couple light to the other already known media, like audio and video, to have a full emergent experience. Here you see an example of a restaurant, of a bar, that is equipped with lighting that couples into the mood of its visitors. Here you see an example of a shopping mall whose lighting setting changes over the day. 
and it adjusts to the shopping public, it seduces the shopping public to do things they normally don't do while shopping. <laughs> Here you see an example in the city. It's called city beautification. It's a Nelson Mandela Bridge in Johannesburg. And what it actually does, it shines the city. It gives the city its own culture. It's part of the creative industries where each individual city will discriminate from each other city primarily through the way it positions itself. And lighting plays a very, very important role in that respect. Here you see another example. This is a street, the Rue de Tubano in Marseille. And that's the type of street you don't want to be in during the night unless you're looking for things you don't expect it. <laughs> Light can mitigate stress. Light can bring the tension down. This is an application that is currently being used by very many cities in their surroundings where people meet and where a lot of pressure can be built up during the evening. Here you see another very interesting example. This is an experience where uh, the city of Rotterdam um, commemorated the bombardment in 1914 by using lasers that shine on the clouds and that give people the feeling to be part of this memorial type of no, uh, known activity and that is an important thing. So it's, it's, the, the global element of this is really outstanding. But it also can be brought to the individual person, like this example of the dancing rail. It was made um, for a museum uh, in London. And what it actually does, it, uh, it gives through the lighting the movement that true dancers make. And if you follow with your hands the movement of the light, you will experience what it means to really dance. This is also a very interesting example. I have brought that with me also. It's this piece of plastic. So there is a small LED in it. It's a light guide. And what you can do with it, you can switch it on. And it shines light. You can put it on a piece of paper and you can read. In all those countries where there is no reliable grid and people, young people would like to develop themselves to become something different from all the rest, education is the thing that they should be doing in the evening. This can help with that type of activity. So let's move on because there is much more. This is also a very interesting experience that was built to alleviate the stress of small children um, that need to go in these scanners. These examinations last often for more than an hour. The stress of the children is high, the stress of the parents is high, the stress of the physicians is high. So what we did is we built a surrounding, a kind of cave for the children, and the children were put at ease. And even the throughput increased by a factor of two. Stress levels of children went down, stress levels of parents went down, the throughput and the productivity of the workers went up. So this is a very simple example of an improvement through lighting in the uh, hospital domain. So we generally believe that the future of lighting will change the world to a very large extent and that new directions need to be explored to set lighting free, if you like. And the things that are important are listed here. It has to do with functionality, with emotional elements, biological elements, societal elements, cultural elements, sustainable elements and ambient elements. But again, this is blah, blah. Because again, the question is, how are we going to set light free in the way that people eventually will benefit from that? And that will show the direction to all these companies that try to change their incandescent business in 10 years from now to a lighting solutions business that is really new. So we need to explore the boundaries. And that's what the call is about. So here you see an object that was uh, uh, designed, for instance, by uh, Tom 
Tom is standing over there and uh, his people. And this, this uh, for me, represents what we would like to achieve. So it's a small object. It's still a bulb. It's open. So the light is freed. And what you see through all kinds of interactions with the digital media, it, it pulses like my heart. It breathes like I breathe. It could be connected to myself. And this, for me, represents what I would like to say and I would like to see as the liberation of light. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen.